Good morning. Oh, boy, it's nice to see you all here this morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm here with uh, Keith and Darren, and we've got Aaron and Betty Lou on the musical thingies over there. Uh, and uh, we're just all really glad to have you all here this morning. Y'all. I, I was listening to the Blind Boys of Alabama last night, so I'm going, y'all. <clears throat> so I'm a little hoarse because I did a lot of hollering last night. I don't know about you, but I'm going to get through this morning by just pretending this is a regular Sunday. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Just another Sunday. This light represents for us the light of Christ. A light that shines within us and within others. A light that shines for us and for others. A light which brings goodness to the world for which we give thanks. Amen. Uh, I want to remind you that this is an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada. That means that we try to be as welcoming as possible to everyone who comes through our doors. Uh, and that's not just a responsibility of the, of the staff here. That's a responsibility you take on yourselves by your presence here. And yes, and if you're looking for uh, something, you don't know where something is, you want to know why we do something the way we do it, find somebody that's wearing a blue ribbon and they'll be able to, uh, to help you out with that. Or... or Pretty much anybody. Where's Keith? What else am I supposed to say? Anything? Is that it? Yeah. Children, yes. Uh, thank you, yes. I, <laughs> it's funny, he always remembers the children part. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, we welcome children. We welcome people who can't sing, and we want you to sing anyway. Uh, we welcome children, even though we know there's some noise that goes along with that, and, and we're okay. We don't mind that. We love the liveliness of this place. Our invitation to worship is a responsive reading. Moses said, Today I set before you life and death. Choose life. And Moses said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These are words of scripture, words of wisdom. Let us therefore give thanks. Let us join together in prayer. And our prayer this morning is uh, one of my favorites. It's 350 years old, and yet I think it has, just speaks to us today. Let's join together saying, O oh God, make the door of this house wide enough to receive all who need human love and fellowship, narrow enough to shut out all envy, pride, and strife. Make its threshold smooth enough to be no stumbling block to children, nor to straying feet, but rugged and strong enough to turn back evil's power. God, make the door of this house the gateway to your eternal kingdom. Amen. Um, yes, this is, uh, let's bring ourselves into a time of prayer with. Uh God of grace and goodness, we give you thanks on this day for your church. With all its failings and weaknesses, it is still the body of Christ, still the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. We give thanks for this corner of your church, this 
church on the corner, St. Martin's, for its many ministries and for its faithful people. May the fruit of the Spirit be abundant among them. We pray for Keith and Darren as they continue in leadership here and for the new minister who will come to work with them. May they be filled with your Spirit and inspired to continue bringing your kingdom into the world. Our prayers today are for others as well. Remembering those we know who are facing difficulties and hardships, we pray for Bob and Laura and Abdul and Harold and Brandy and Stephen and Adam and Hillary and for many others. We pray for healing, for wholeness, and for peace. We pray also for the families and friends of Erwin Anderson, Marjorie Robinson, and Penny Banks in their time of sorrow. We pray also for this world, which is both yours and ours. We pray for the leaders of business and of government at every level, that their policies will be generated by wisdom and compassion and will serve to bring justice and prosperity for all and not just for some. We pray for peace and an end to discrimination, oppression, and the belief that violent conflict can solve our problems. For all that blesses us, we give you thanks. For all that troubles us, we turn to you in prayer, seeking relief and resolution if that is possible, but whether it is or not, yearning for the comfort and serenity of knowing your presence and for the strength and courage of your companionship on the journey. These things we dare to ask because of Jesus. And together we join in the prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This morning's reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Amen to that. <laughs> okay, let's get down to it. Here we are in the fifth of my five faves. As I said at the beginning of this series, though, I didn't start nearly soon enough. I have way more than five faves. <laughs> my list, for example, leaves out Romans 8, 38, 39, which says that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And nothing, I believe, means nothing. Nothing we have done, nothing we have failed to do. Nothing we did or nothing that we might do, nothing that has been done to us. Nothing can separate us from God's love, which is best known to us in the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey draws on Romans 8 to say this. He says, There is nothing we can do that will make God love us more. There is nothing we can do that will make God love us less. Nothing. Now, I expect there's someone out there at this point who is saying to themselves, well, if it doesn't make any difference, <laughs> why bother with all this church stuff? Why take the trouble to live a faithful life if God's going to love us anyway? And the answer to that question is that the faithful life is a better life, a more enjoyable and more rewarding life. I'm going to say more about that when I get to talk about today's fave. But another reading that got left off the list is from the first epistle of John, chapter 4, in which he says, if I can paraphrase, that the essence of God's nature is love. Now, you know, some children, boys and girls, are made of snakes and snails and puppy dogs' tails, and others, boys and girls, are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. But if you ask what God is made of, the answer is love. John goes on to say that anyone who knows love knows God. Let me just, 
Anyone who knows love knows God. Or as Victor Hugo wrote in Les Miserables, to love another person is to see the face of God. Of course, John's not just talking about mushy romantic love. He means the real thing, <clears throat> which mushy romantic love can lead to, but which is all about giving of oneself for the other. I read this week in the newspaper a story about Ashley Plageman, who was killed near Hague by a drunk driver five years ago, and whose last words as she lay dying on the side of the road were, save my kids. See, that's love. But to get back to my five faves, <clears throat> first was Micah 6, in which the prophet reveals that God has very little interest in the trappings and practices of religion for its own sake. Instead, God longs for us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Then came Jeremiah at the potter's house. In this incident, God says, I will change my mind, letting us know not only that history is not written ahead of time, but also that God waits to see what we will do next. Think about that. God is waiting to see what we will do next. We act with free will. God reacts to our action. We react to God's... Re and, God, and it goes on. We are all... God included, making it up as we go along. For the third week, I got stuck in Jeremiah. This time, God says, <clears throat> I will write my law upon their hearts. And from this, we know that God keeps trying to, enter, to find ways to interact with us, keeps on until it finds a way that works. And also that the life of faith is not one of deprivation, but of fulfillment of doing our heart's desire because our hearts are changed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's, a, it's an upgrade. It's a reboot of your operating system. It's a new way of being. Fave 4 took us closer to today's reading because in it, Jesus talked about the life of faith as an abundant life. Not just full, but shaken together, pressed down, overflowing, more than full. And that should get us to today's reading, but first I want to tell you about something that I found while I was cleaning up my office. It's a short article written by Dr. Millard Shoemaker, who was one of my professors at Queen's Theological College. Millard taught systematic theology and Christian ethics. And I can tell you that the readings for his classes were pretty tough slogging. <laughs> but the classes themselves were great because Millard mostly just told us funny stories about growing up as a Nebraska farm boy. <laughs> Those stories brought life to some pretty dry texts. Anyway, in this article that I, that I had saved but forgotten about, Millard wrote about seeing a cartoon that showed two small children with their report cards. And one showed an F, and the other one showed a D, and the child with the D is saying to the one with the F, I'm available for tutoring. <laughs> what Millard and I both share is that we, we feel like the child with the D. To be a minister is to say, in effect, I don't know much, but I'm available for tutoring. As always, though, Millard had a more serious point to make. And I'll let, it explain, I'll, I'll let him explain it himself. I want to say a few words in favor of theological modesty, he wrote. For a lot of people, being a Christian consists in believing certain things. And what sort of Christian you are depends on what sort of things you believe. Often, one need not have any opinion at all on various theological questions in order to be a faithful Christian. I want to say that again. Often one need not have any opinion at all on various theological questions in order to be a faithful Christian. We must learn that the great truths of Christianity are not somehow prerequisites for being Christian. They are instead amongst the precious gifts which accrue to the faithful. End of quote. And that's one of the points I want to make about today's reading, which I'm finally getting to, in which the Apostle Paul lists what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. 
In other words, the harvest or the end result of a faithful life. You can see Paul's list on these two new banners that are hanging in our church here. Um, thanks to Jeanette Liberty Duns and Elaine Crocker for, uh, for your talent and your hard work. Uh, now, they didn't know that I was going to be talking about this very reading when they made these. So uh, it's, uh, some would say, serendipitous. Some would say it's the work of the Spirit. Paul's point is that the harvest of an apple orchard is apples, of an orange grove is oranges, but the harvest of a faithful life is there on the wall. Peace, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, joy, love, patience, gentleness, and goodness. Against these, he says, there's no law. And he's right. In fact, these are all seen to be positive qualities. More than positive qualities, they're, they're seen to be life-enriching, life-enhancing qualities. I mean, consider the alternative. A life of hate and unhappiness and anxiety and pessimism and meanness and money-grubbing. Who here thinks that sounds like fun? Who would rather be at peace with themselves and be happy and loving and kind and generous and faithful? That says Paul, that, that's the life of the Spirit. Too many so-called Christians go through life, <laughs> go through life, and you know, Saturday Night Live does it beautifully, uh, go through life as if they are spiritually constipated. <laughs> and honestly, they're giving the rest of us a bad name. Somehow it's become a secret that the life of faith is the good life, is the abundant life, is the rich and satisfying life. And just like a tree that produces something other than apples is not an apple tree, you can be pretty sure, a life that doesn't produce the fruits of the Spirit is not a faithful life. Paul's list is a promise, yes, but it's also a checklist against which we can measure our, the state of our spiritual formation. And notice that Paul, who, who typically explains everything at great length, does not bother explaining, saying anything about the fruits of the Spirit except to list them. I guess he thinks they're self-explanatory. And I suppose he's right. But <laughs> I do say, want to say just a couple of things about generosity, which I think is one of the key gifts. If by faith we can generate generosity... I think the rest will follow. And when I think about generosity, I'm reminded of the story of the earnest young preacher, like this guy, <clears throat> who, uh, who thought he had a, a building project for his church. They're going to put a new wing on the church. And, and before he goes to the, to the church to, ask, you know, to set up a fundraising campaign, <clears throat> he thinks, well, I'm going to bring in some outside money first. And so he goes to the richest man in town. And he lays, he makes an appointment with him and sits across his desk from the guy and, and, uh, and lays out his proposal. <clears throat> and the rich man says, excuse me. <clears throat> rich guy says, well, I suppose you've come to me because you know I'm successful. And I suppose you think I've got a lot of money to pass around. But there are probably some things you don't know about me, he said. Did you know, for example, that, uh, that my, uh, my sister's husband just died and left her with five children and not a penny to her name? No, I didn't know that, said the young preacher. Did you know that my mother is <clears throat> in a nursing home and requires 24-hour private nursing care, which is really expensive? No, I, I didn't know that. Did you know that my son's business just went out of business and he's just declared bankruptcy? I'm responsible for him. Did you know that? No, I, I didn't know that. Well, they said... If I don't give them any money, why would I give any money to you? <laughs> but generosity, or the lack of it, is not primarily about money. It is about money. And being generous financially is a sure way to prove to yourself that you're living with an abundance mindset and not a scarcity mindset. But the generosity that is a fruit of a spiritual life extends to being generous in our opinion of others, generous in our judgments, generous 
with forgiveness, generous with hospitality, generous with compassion, generous just in the way we treat people and the way we treat ourselves. If we can nurture in our spirits that kind of generosity, then the other fruits of the Spirit will just be part of our lives as well. And don't forget, over the summer, we are hoping to collect 150 acts of random kindness, so be generous with your kindnesses this summer as well. As my dear old professor said, Christian faith is not about believing this doctrine or that theological premise. It's about how we live, about the fruit that we bear. As we move forward, me into retirement and you into new ministry opportunities, I pray that the Spirit will bless you with a good and rich harvest of the fruit of the Spirit that leads to abundant life. Amen. Well, I want to thank you once more for uh, all you've uh, done for me and with me, all we've done together in this place. Uh, God bless you for all that you have been and will continue to be. Uh, I think I will leave you with the blessing that, if I remember correctly, uh, that I used at that covenanting service uh, 12 years ago, which is this. Go now in peace and try to be the kind of person your dog already thinks you are. <laughs> go in peace and may God go with you all. And stay for pie. <laughs>